from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snow. Thank you for downloading my fly fishing educational podcast. My name is Rob Snow White. This episode is brought to you by Solo Stove. Phil Monahan is the guy behind the scenes in the fly fishing industry. He's the guy behind the Orvis blog at Orvis.com. He's been doing it for a decade and considers himself the only full-time fly fishing blogger with health benefits. We're going to hear Phil's story from rural New Hampshire to northern Jersey to Alaska and then back to New England where he currently resides. If you are in the Mid-Atlantic region and are expecting a biblical plague of cicadas this spring, please go to my Etsy site where you can purchase cicada fly tying kits and cicada flies. The prices will be going up and there are tutorials on how to tie them on my YouTube site. Solo Stove designs simple and genius outdoor products to help you create good moments that become lasting memories. From camp stoves and virtually smokeless fire pits to grills, they have you covered. Their bonfire, our bonfire gets so hot, a bottle cap will melt within seconds. I don't suggest you do it, but it's pretty cool to see. And I'm hoping to use my Titan stove on a road trip before the month is over, depending on weather. For good moments, for good memories, for great products, so you can create a good life, check out Solo Stove at every purchase you make through my website or social media it helps me as a very small business owner. So please, please visit robsnowway.com and click on the Solo Stove link or visit the link tree in my social media. Feel the warmth? Get up to $100 off with the Bring On Spring Sale. Remember, do not use exclamation points. And next week, we're going to go back to the life history of a specific fish species. And I'm going to talk about some of the not-so-fun stuff that's been going on here the last several months. So let's get to the podcast. Let's hear from Phil. Cool. Yeah. All right, let's go. We have Phil Monahan with us. Most of you know him from Orvis these days. Phil, we're going to find out about your life, but first I want to find out where you are and then find out who you look like for those listening maybe in a far off place that haven't seen your picture holding a, a sandwich or a piece of dynamite on the block. I'm uh, sitting at my dining room table in lovely Sandgate, Vermont, where it is currently eight degrees. And uh, I'm watching my very active bird feeder, which is uh, my favorite thing to do when I'm pretending to work. What sort of birds do you have these days in your, your winter group? <laughs> uh, you know, you have got your standard chickadees, blue jays, nuthatches, titmice, titmouses, titmice. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know which one you go for there. But my favorite is we have a pileated woodpecker that comes to the trees at the edge of the yard. Very nice. Uh, and they're very cool. For those of you who don't know, p the pileated woodpecker is the largest of the woodpeckers. It's like it, two feet tall. Yeah, it looks like a pterodactyl. Yeah, it's very cool. We have had our boat tailed <clears throat> grackles arrive this, this week from their wintering grounds. So spring should not be too far off. I hope so. Yeah, I saw some uh, hints of 50s on the 10-day forecast, so yeah, I think it's coming. Yeah. All right. Uh, in terms of whom I look like? Yeah, do you have a celebrity um, doppelganger? A lot of, ever since I was in college, I've gotten Tom Hanks. And in fact, I had a friend call me from the movie theater while watching Captain Phillips, saying that she was having difficulty watching the movie because she thought Tom Hanks looked like me. We need to monetize that sometime. <laughs> stunt double yeah next time at the edison show we got to take you to new york city if you like oh look we got tom hanks with us you gotta let us in oh god i hope there'll be an edison show someday yeah i guess the texas brew festival over this past weekend was the only show that happened this year wow i didn't even know it was happening that's all outdoors right i'm not sure I think it is. Phil, how did, how did you get into fly fishing? How did I get into fly fishing? Um, well, I grew up in southern New Hampshire, uh, so I'm a rural boy. And 
for as long as I can remember, I was a fisherman. Uh, my favorite thing to do when I was a kid was to go pickerel fishing, usually with live shiners under a bobber. I can fished all through high school, but then I went to college in New York City, so I sort of fell off the, the fishing bandwagon and didn't really pick it up again until I went to the University of New Hampshire to get a master's degree. And my brother lived nearby, my older brother, Brian, and he had taken up fly fishing. So he taught me to cast a fly rod in the backyard of his girlfriend's house in Pembroke, New Hampshire, one day in, God, it must have been 1989. I never looked back. Did you plan on going to school in New York City, being from the country and, and having a whole completely different? Absolutely um, not. Absolutely not. My, uh, my two main college choices came down to Middlebury in Vermont and Columbia in New York City. And I said, okay, I'll go to Middlebury. Father looked at me and he said, get in the car. And he drove me to New York City and I spent a, an incredible weekend with my dad in New York City. Uh, it was one of those amazing spring days when everyone comes out of hibernation. He said to me, this might be the only time in your life you can afford to live here. You should do it. Yeah. So I did it. Were you able to fish at all when you were in school? Nope. I don't believe I fished one time in the four years I was in college. I don't even think I fished during the summers. It was, uh, I was always working. But uh, yeah, it was definitely a hiatus. The college years were a hiatus for me, but I made up for it later. Right. And did you have a typewriter back then that you were putting some words down on? Had you always wanted to, to put words on paper? Well, uh, I'm actually a failed academic. So after, after I went to, got a master's degree at UNH, I went to get a PhD at Rutgers in central New Jersey. So I am what is known as ABD. I did everything but write the dissertation. ABD stands for all but dissertation on a PhD in English. And that's when I really ramped up the fishing thing was when I got to Rutgers. Because when you reach that level of academia, you no longer pay for it. And in fact, they start paying you. So when I got to Rutgers, I was teaching freshman composition and literature courses. And that meant that I didn't have to spend my summers banking a whole bunch of money. So my first year at Rutgers in the winter, I sent out 110 cover letters and resumes. This is pre-email, of course to fly fishing lodges all over the West and in Alaska. And I got exactly one job offer out of those 110 cover letters and resumes for a place in Alaska called Deshka River Lodge. And that launched my career in fishing. Is that where the picture of you with the neoprenes and the shotgun came from? No, that was a little later at a different Alaska Lodge. No, the Deshka River Lodge turned out to be a disaster. Oh, no. Um, Please tell. Oh, well. Uh, did they burn it down? I once worked in a lodge <laughs> that was burnt down by locals. No, they did not burn it down. So the, this guy who hired me, uh, who shall remain nameless so I don't get sued, you know, described this as a remote fly-in lodge, and he told all these great stories. And I was going to go up there and just be a maintenance guy in his – quote unquote, guide training program. So I arrived at the airport in Anchorage, fresh from New Jersey, and there was nobody there to meet me. Oh no. So, I, like so I, I lay upon my pile of, of luggage and gear and sleeping bag and whatnot for about three hours until this really beat to shit smoking van pulled up outside. And this guy hopped out. He's like, you must be Phil. Not sorry, I'm late. Not, you know, is everything okay? So we got in the van. He said to me, all right, so you're going to stay in my office in, in Anchorage for a couple of days, and then uh, you'll go out to the lodge to get it ready for the season. This was May 20th. And I said, great. How many of us are going out to the lodge? He said, just you. So I'd never been to Alaska in my life. I had been living in New Jersey and suddenly I was being sent out to the Alaska bush by myself to get this, to get the lodge ready. 
this is a very long story that I won't tell the whole thing, but the lodge never opened. And I worked there from May 20th to July 14th, never got paid. And there were long stretches of time where he didn't, eventually a couple of other guys came out to join me and he didn't bring us any food for long stretches of time. So we would subsistence fish for King Salmon at the mouth of the Deshka River. Almost everything you told me about the lodge was a lie. It was not fly-in only. There was a boat launch on the Susitna River a few miles away. And yeah, so that was that was a crazy experience. But the good thing was during my time on the Deshka River, I I met a guy who flew in on his own plane from Anchorage and through him. I so on July 14th, I said, All right, finally I'm out. I someone had come up to the lodge in a boat and I said, Can you can you haul me out of here? So I, I went back to Anchorage, I had a place to stay. And I gave myself one week to find a job before I would have to uh, go back to New Jersey with my tail between my legs. That's when I ended up, my first real Alaska guiding job was at a place called Chalatna Lake Lodge, which is about 90 miles northwest of Anchorage on a beautiful eight mile long lake that runs right into the Alaska range. And it's the headwaters of Lake Creek, which is a, a stream that some Alaska people may be familiar with. Big change of scenery and lifestyle once you got there? They started feeding you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But Chilatna Lake Lodge might be the most beautifully sighted lodge in Alaska. It, it Really, you, you look right out at the Alaska Range. 14,000-foot uh, Mount Russell is at the end of the lake. And then just over the next hump is the Cahiltna Glacier, which goes up to Denali. Yeah, so that was a, that was a, a really great experience. It was not a fly fishing only lodge. Uh, but I became sort of the resident fly fishing specialist, did a lot of great float fishing, caught all species of salmon, pike, of course, rainbow trout. And it really was a great way to sort of get into the guiding lifestyle. Uh, and then, of course, when, when August rolled around, I, I headed back to graduate school. So I did that for two summers. And then I was all set to go up there for a third summer, which would have been, yikes, 93, I think. Congress had changed the law for what companies could write off their taxes. And suddenly, corporate fishing trips were no longer a tax write-off. And so the, the owner of the lodge called me frantically saying, don't come, don't come. I suddenly have no guests in June, and I can't afford to hire you. So once again, I went back to the uh, cover letter and resume game and ended up getting hired uh, another fantastic lodge in Paradise Valley, Hubbard's Yellowstone Lodge. So I went from Alaska to Montana, which was another huge learning experience for me. I went from throwing huge hunks of meat and egg flies to fishing on the Spring Creeks in Paradise Valley with size 20 comparadons. Yeah, it's a little bit different. And that was a great experience because it's right at the north entrance of Yellowstone National Park. So I spent almost every day in the park, fishing mostly the, the north and the west sides of the park, did float trips on the Yellowstone and fished the Spring Creeks of Paradise Valley. So it was sort of a cool counterpoint to the Alaska chuck and duck uh, experience that I'd had to, to really sharpen my teeth on those technical waters in, in the park and in Paradise Valley. What did your other classmates and friends and peers do during the summer while you're out bushwhacking in the West? Uh, you know, they either did summer jobs or traveled around Europe or whatever. It was an interesting experience in that, you know, I spent nine months of the year doing sort of esoteric academic stuff and the other three months of the year doing this sort of physical, outdoorsy, uh, Grizzly Adams type of stuff. And neither group of people could understand the other. So the, the people I went to graduate school couldn't really understand what the hell I was doing during the summer. You know, when I was in Alaska, they just assumed I worked on a fishing boat. And when I tried to explain it, they didn't really get it. And of course, 
a lot of the people I worked with in Alaska and out west couldn't understand why I would still be going to school when I was 29 years old. Yeah, um, it confuses people. Where I'm yeah. from, that's normal. <laughs> so after Paradise Valley, I really wanted to go back to Alaska. And through the connections I'd made previously, I landed a job out in Bristol Bay at Rainbow River Lodge, which is on the Copper River, which drains into Lake Iliamna on the southern side. And that's fly fishing only, catch and release. And what's cool about Rainbow River Lodge is that it was really a trout fishing lodge. I think that's more common now, but back then, most Alaskan lodges were really focused on salmon with trout as sort of a secondary thing. But Rainbow River Lodge was a rainbow trout lodge. And the Copper River is super cool because it's not glacial. So it's one of the few clear water rivers that flows into Lake Iliamna, and it has incredible hatches. So I got to take a lot of the stuff that I had learned during my Montana summer and apply it to the Copper River, uh, which sort of set me apart from all the other guides up there who are real hardcore Alaska dudes. Yeah. So for instance, the single biggest stonefly hatch I've ever seen in my life was in Alaska which is mind blowing. Great caddis hatches, mayfly hatches. And that was all great until the sockeyes showed up and then it was eggs, eggs, eggs. Tell me about this devil's club. Devil's club? Yeah, and that the plant up in Alaska that's it's like, it's more thorns than anything else. Did you have to deal with that? I don't know, I never did, no. Yeah, you're lucky. But it sounds like something nasty, like uh, scotch broom and, and Washington and Oregon, that sort of thing, where it's in an, it's just nasty. Or yes. gorse. Have you ever run into gorse? I have not. Where is that located? Well, gorse is native to uh, the UK, but the British like to uh, bring home with them wherever they went. So I ran into gorse, strangely enough, when I was fishing in Tasmania. And it was truly nasty stuff with huge spikes on it. Would that, would that be what they... They get their slow gin from the slow berries. That's got some huge thorns. I don't know. Interesting. Um, yeah. So after Rainbow River Lodge, which was an amazing summer, I mean, bears every day, incredible rainbow trout fishing, a little bit of salmon fishing, a little bit of pike fishing. I went back to Rutgers and I, I had a dissertation fellowship. Now, Dissertation fellowship is cool because they pay you to do nothing. You're supposed to be writing your dissertation. But at that point, I think I'd sort of decided that I wasn't going to go through with it. So I spent most of that year learning how to play the guitar and watching European soccer on TV. And then when that year ran out, I had met a woman. I was going to leave school. Suddenly, quote unquote, real life was calling. I freaked out one day, it was a Wednesday, and I decided I had to find a job. And the only two things I knew how to do were to fish and write. So I thought, what does that qualify me to do? I said, well, I better find a job in a sporting magazine. So I drove down to the local Borders bookstore and took all the sporting magazines off the rack. I couldn't afford to buy them because I didn't have any money. And I, again, sent out cover letters and resumes to, I think, seven sporting magazines, all the fly fishing magazines, all of the big three, as they were known at the time, Outdoor Life, Field and Stream, and Sports of Field. So that was a Wednesday. The next Monday, I got a call from Outdoor Life. The next Monday, I had an interview in New York City at Outdoor Life. The next Monday, I had a job and quit school. Wow. And that, was, that was the beginning of my magazine career. So again, it was, I was the, in the same way that I was the fly fishing specialist at Chalatney Lake Lodge, I became the fly fishing specialist at Outdoor Life because it's really a deer hunting magazine with uh, some fishing, but not all that much fly fishing. But it was uh, an amazing place to learn how to be a magazine editor. I had some incredible mentors. Jerry Gibbs, who was the longtime fishing editor of Outdoor Life is an incredible guy, uh, 
super nice man, great fisherman, really one of the most conscientious editors I've ever met and a, a whole slew of other people. And it, it got me, it, that gave me the chance to also do sporting travel. I'd always been on the guide end of sporting travel and uh, suddenly with a magazine, I could be on the client end of sporting travel, which was pretty cool. Was that the heyday of rather large budgets to go write an article in some cool far off destination? That was all starting to to end. I mean, my my friend Bob Brown, who was one of my editors at Outdoor Life, tells stories of the heydays of the 60s and 70s when really that was, uh, I mean, Outdoor Life was like 220 pages every month. And that was that was the time of big budgets and, and stuff like that. Uh, Do you remember your first article? My first article? Wow, I don't think I do. I think my first sort of big trip article was I, I went up to, so I, I, asked my, I asked the editor of Outdoor Life why I wasn't getting promoted because I thought I was pretty good at this. And he looked me in the eye and said, you haven't killed enough shit. And I said, what? He said, too much fishing. He said, we're a hunting magazine. You need to go kill something. I said, okay. He said, all right, you want to go kill a caribou in Quebec? Hey, no. I said, I said, sure. I'll go, I'll go kill a caribou in Quebec. So we went uh, way into far northern Quebec into a place that was had previously not been open to sporting. It was native land that had just opened. And I went up there to, we traveled to far northern Quebec, west of, I think it was the 70th parallel, one of those, where the, which had just been opened to hunting and fishing. And the goal was to shoot a caribou. But on the first day, we realized that our guide was a salmon guide during the rest of the season and only short for a short period of time was a hunting guide to make money so when he found out that we were fishermen he was all excited and so we ended up i think we had a five-day trip and we spent the first four days fishing for giant wild brook trout oh my gosh so big brook uh, trout here seven eight inches big brook trout up in Five pounds, five pound river, five pound mouse eating brook trout. With the teeth on them. Oh yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. And you know, then we got like four days in and we're like, oh shit, we have to go shoot a caribou. So luckily caribou are kind of like cows. You find a whole bunch of them and then you shoot one. So that was, it. that, that really didn't fill me with unmixed delight. I didn't, I think it was probably at that point I realized I, I wasn't long for Outdoor Life magazine, but it was an incredible reason to go to an absolutely pristine wilderness and catch these incredible brook trout. You know, I grew up in Southern New Hampshire catching six inch stocked brook trout to be able to stand on a rock and look down into the water at a school of a hundred brook trout between three and five pounds was simply mind blowing. Yeah. And I wouldn't comprehend that unless I saw that. <laughs> I, I stayed at Outdoor Life for two years, and one of my fellow editors at Outdoor Life had a friend who was the editor of a new magazine called Saltwater Fly Fishing. And Saltwater Fly Fishing was, had just been launched by a company called Abenaki Publishers based in Bennington, Vermont. And at that point, I had realized, you know, I was, I'd realized that New York City was a place a great place to be if you are young or rich. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. I wasn't young anymore and I was a magazine editor. So I, I started plotting my exit. So Abenaki Publishers was looking for a new editor for American Angler Magazine. So I came up and interviewed and took the flyer. My, by, by that time I was married and I married a woman who grew up on the Jersey Shore and I brought her to the wilds of Vermont. And then I was the editor of a magazine of American Angler magazine for the next 10 years. And that was really when I got to launch the incredible travel fly fishing adventures that made the whole thing 
just simply amazing. I mean, I traveled and fished places I never would have thought of. I'd have the chance to do it. If you could just name a couple. Just oh, sure. Different. New Zealand, uh, Tasmania, Ireland, the Bahamas, Belize, all over the West. Uh, it was really spectacular. The Spanish Pyrenees. And, you know, when I got to American Angler Magazine, I quickly realized that there were, at the time, three national fly fishing magazines. Fly Fisherman, of course, was the granddaddy of them all. John Randolph was still the editor there. And Fly Rod and Reel was, was based in Maine. And I had to figure out a way to sort of differentiate American Angler from the other magazines. And one of the ways I did that was I didn't do high-end travel. I, anytime I did a travel story, I tried to do it as inexpensively as possible, which sometimes was awesome, sometimes wasn't. Uh, I, I took a trip to Argentina where the outfitter was charging $300 a day for lodging, food, and guiding, which is way cheaper than you can do Montana. Unfortunately, you got what you paid for. Some of the worst guiding experiences of my life were on that trip. But a lot of them turned out really, really great. You know, the, the Tasmania trip we did was a DIY one where we flew in and got in a camper van and drove all around the island for a week and fished. Unfortunately, the fishing was terrible, but the experience was amazing. But you know, people think that's all you do when you're a magazine editor when 95% of the time you're stuck in front of your computer editing a story by someone who's really doing the thing that you want to do. Do you have any favorite words you like to use when writing? Are you, are you like a word person, vocabulary? Are you well, I certainly like vocabulary, but I can't think of specific words because I try not to repeat myself as much as possible. I do have some, you know, really hard and fast editing rules that I try to stick by. Uh, one I'm sort of known for is uh, I have two rules about exclamation points. Uh, and the first one was taught to me by a college professor who said, you are allowed one exclamation point for your entire life. And the other uh, comes from a great book of grammar that I found published sometime in the 1920s. And it's one rule on exclamation points was don't. I gotta reference that to my daughter who ends every sentence <laughs> in her fourth grade writing with the exclamation point. You know, I have very specific theories of how to do how to journalism which is what American Angler was. American Angler always positioned itself as the magazine that was really going to teach you how to fly fish. And what I found when I got there was a lot of writers tried to bite off too big a subject. And I remember teaching myself how to fly fish from reading Fly, fishing, fly Fisherman magazine when I was at Rutgers. And I was always frustrated when I found myself on the water and I knew 80% of what to do, but it was the 20% that I didn't really know what to do that was killing me. So my theory of how to journalism was to focus your subject as narrowly as possible so that you can cover it completely. So for instance, uh, Harry Murray, the Dean of the Shenandoah, yes. you must know Harry. About two hour drive from here. Yeah. 66 so, West 81. One of the nicest men in fly fishing and, and really a brilliant angler. But for years, he had basically been writing three articles, how to fish a nymph, how to fish a dry fly, how to fish a streamer. And so he pitched me on how to fish a streamer. And I said, Harry, that's a, that's a book length project. We're trying to do a magazine article. How can we make this so specific that you can share your expertise in such a way that someone can go right out and use it. 
So we net we ended up doing the article how to fish a streamer under a fallen log. So we took this incredibly broad topic, narrowed it to one very specific angling situation, and he wrote this fantastic article that I learned something from at, as the editor and, and the audience loved. And it was so discreet that he could really nail the topic in such a way that it helped people go out and catch more fish. So that has uh, that that philosophy has stayed with me through today. And when I do how-to articles on the Orvis fly fishing blog, I try to maintain that same level of specificity and completeness so that we're not kind of teaching people how to do something. We're teaching them how to do something as as much as we possibly can and, and that they can then go out and use that skill on their everyday fishing. Right. Did you ever hear from high school teachers that saw you published or, or did not think you would become a writer and were quite pleased to see you published? No, I mean, I think I had always been good at it, even from elementary school. I was a voracious reader as a child. My father is an incredible reader. So I, I grew up in a house full of books. So I think it was something that I, I had always been pretty good at. Uh, and then, you know, having taught freshman composition for seven years at UNH and Rutgers had taught me how to take really poorly written prose and unclear ideas and sharpen them, which is what you're trying to teach a college freshman how to do, and which works perfectly when some fishing guide in Montana who is brilliant at the fishing part of it, but not a brilliant writer, sends you a story, I would always rather have great information poorly written than beautifully written poor information. So I have always told anyone who, who feels like I'm not a good enough writer to write for a magazine or for the Orvis blog or whatever, I always tell them the writing is really my job. My job is to make you look good. Your job is to share this expertise that you have. So it's really a collaborative project. Every, every magazine article, every blog post written by somebody else, it's a collaborative project. It's not one person is a great writer and they just get their stuff printed or, or put online. So how did you end up at, at Orvis up in Vermont? Well, I was the, um, I was the editor of American Angler when uh, the Great Recession of 2008 hit. And by that time, the magazine business was already in trouble. Uh, online advertising had cannibalized magazine advertising. So magazines had less and less money to work with. So... At that point, I was literally the only editor working on American Angler. So people said to me, are, are you worried about your job? And I said, how could they fire me? I'm the only editor. So then they fired me. Um, <laughs> December 18th, 2008, uh, you may note that that's one week before Christmas. Uh, I got a phone call and got, got canned over the phone, which for anyone who's ever been laid off is sort of a terrifying prospect. Uh, especially when you consider being a fly fishing magazine editor uh, is pretty rarefied air. There aren't a million of those jobs out there. I ended up being a freelance writer and editor for about 18 months. I, that's when I started writing a column for Midcurrent. And, you know, uh, just took whatever work I could get. I, I did fly fishing writing. I ended up uh, ghost writing stories for a friend of mine who owns a very large PR company, international PR company in Washington, D.C. He had clients in the Middle East, which were engaged in a war in which one family claimed another family had stolen $10 billion for them. So I ended up writing, ghost writing articles that would appear in the newspaper in like Bahrain, about uh, this court case. 
So, I mean, when you're a freelancer, you do what you can do to, to bring home the bacon. And meanwhile, I only live 13 minute drive from Orvis headquarters, and I already lived here. And in fact, throughout much of my career while I lived here, when people heard I was a fly fishing writer, they said, oh, you must work for Orvis. And I would say, no, I don't work for Orvis. But then in the spring of 2010, uh, Jamie Hathaway, who worked at Orvis, uh, had convinced the powers that be to launch a fly fishing blog. And he came to me and said, would you be the editor of this fly fishing blog? Uh, and I said, does it pay money? And he said, yes. And I said, great, I'll do it. And so I started at, as a freelancer writing the, the fly fishing blog before it ever appeared online, uh, helping put it together and, and create content so that it wouldn't start from zero. And then I was, it was only about three weeks after the blog launched, a, a copywriting job at Orvis became available. And Paul Fearson, who was the head copywriter, said, you know, I know this isn't what you want to do, but I'd like to get you in the door here. So in addition to writing the Orvis fly fishing blog, I took a job where I wrote every single marketing email that went out for Orvis, including ones about women's clothing. And I did that for about six months before they said, you know what, we really think this, uh, this blog thing is going to fly. And then I, that's when I started doing that full time. And thus I became the world's only full time with benefits fly fishing blogger pretty amazing yeah so we celebrated our 10th anniversary last september you know since then i've taken on a whole bunch of other duties my official title now is managing editor for digital content so uh, i'm really in charge of the blog and any brand content that shows up on the orvis website that's not you know on product pages and stuff like that are you ever allowed to link the old mid-current articles? Because you've covered almost everything. Yeah, I, well, I mean, I, I definitely early on repurposed a lot of those articles. But, I mean, we're at over 10,000 posts now. So I, I burned through that stuff years ago. Right. And how is your viewership and your stats? You get all over the world, some obscure places. Yeah, so we we topped three million visits last year, and you know, as you would imagine, the vast majority majority of them are from those places where people fly fish. So the Rockies, the Northeast, and Mid Atlantic. Uh, we have quite a few from the Southeast, but yeah, plenty of of international audience as well, which is always tough on me when I run a contest because I always have to tell them they can't participate and they get mad especially the canadians oh boy have you found any certain topics are, are hotter than others for clicks well i mean uh, i don't know if you've been on the internet in the last four years things have gotten a little heated out there in the world and you would be probably not surprised to find that um People like to take their political, social, whatever views and inject them into uh, whatever topic is at hand. So I try to stay away from the super hot button stuff. But uh, as far as fly fishing goes, the how-to stuff is definitely the most engaging. You will, you will never run out of people who want to become better anglers. It's like the golf world. You know, the, the golf magazines and websites never run out of people who think to themselves, I really want to be better at this. Plus, you, you know, you always have to keep in mind the audience is turning over quite a bit. Um, when I first started at American Angler, Art Sheck, who was the editor I took over from, who is a genius, he said, you know, Theoretically, you could run an article on how to tie a muddler minnow in every issue of the magazine and people wouldn't complain because 
there are few people in the world who can tie a really good muddler minnow. So, yeah, I mean, what you're looking to do is provide the person who's reading your blog post something of value that when they go out on the water and they try it and it works, they think, holy crap, those guys know what they're talking about. I'm going to go back. It's not that much different from a magazine. It's more accessible. Exactly. And you have the ability to push it rather than just have people come to you. Right. Was your trip to Slovenia, was that just for work or was that also for pleasure? I, that's a very memorable trip that you took because I hadn't really seen a whole bunch of Slovenia before. Well, so uh, that came about because uh, the guy that we fished with, Matt Calderero, had been the rod designer at Orvis. So he and I had become friends when he worked at Orvis, uh, and he was married to a German woman. And when he left Orvis, they moved to Germany. And he started kicking around that part of Europe to see where the really good fly fishing was. And that's when he fell into the Socha Valley and realized, as you said, it had not been highly publicized at the time. He and I put together this trip and it was, I mean, it was for work. I, I wrote about it on both the uh, Orvis blog and I think that one was in American Angler. It could have been Gray's. But that was the beauty of, of going from the magazine world to the blogging world was that I could actually make use of both. I still had enough friends in the magazine world that I could call them up and say, I'm going to Slovenia. Do you want to feature your article on it? And they would say yes. So I could do sort of the immediate experience online. You know, every day, at the end of every day, I would sit down and write a blog post. So that audience could sort of enjoy the trip with me as it happened. And then it was all, when it was all over, then I could package it in a form that worked for a magazine that would give more of an overall view and uh, that you could sort of find meaning and stuff in it that maybe you didn't really realize it in the moment, but in retrospect uh, made sense. And then once the magazine runs the article and they use their publishing rights, then you publish that article on the blog. Interesting. So was the water it, there really just the craziest clear turquoise? Sea? Well, the the Socha itself is blue; it, it's glacial, but the other streams were really spectacularly clear, like I I hadn't seen anywhere else. Yeah, every time I see a picture of Slovenia now, social media or print, I just know it's Slovenia. Just that yeah. Water. It's hard though. I mean, you know. Everybody thinks that if you go to one of these destinations, the fishing is going to be easy. And those marble trout were hard. And the fact of the matter is that can happen anywhere. Uh, like I said, when we went to Tasmania, the fishing was brutal. You know, it was 36 hours travel time from New York to Hobart, Tasmania. And we get off the plane and the guy who whom I had been talking to set up the trip, one of the first things out of his mouth was, I've lived here 30 years, never seen worse fishing than the last six weeks. That's not what you want to hear. <laughs> Which is exactly what you want to hear. Um, and even when I worked in Alaska, one of the toughest weeks I ever had was there was a guest from Utah who had been up three years earlier and hit everything perfectly. Had the trip of a lifetime. Went home talked up the place to all his buddies and brought them all back. You know, each of them puts down, I think at the time it was 6,500 bucks a week and every river was blown out and muddy. And this poor guy was panicking because he talked all of his friends into coming up for this incredible fishing experience and it was really hard. So I always tell people, everyone, says to me, you know, is X worth it? Is a trip to Alaska worth it? Is a trip to Slovenia worth it? Is a trip to New Zealand worth it? And my stock response is, 
if your ability to have a good time is predicated on great fishing, don't go anywhere. You have to go to these destinations expecting things to not be as good as you hope, but still allow yourself to have a good time anyway. I had an amazing time in Tasmania. I mean, the, really the only bad part about Tasmania was I knew I had to produce one fish. Because when you're writing a magazine article, you really just need that one photograph, right? For the opening spread. And I had exactly one shot at a big brown trout in Tasmania and I blew it. There's a, there's a part of the, so Tasmania is an incredible place. It's an island that has a plateau in the center of it. And there's a place called the Western Highlands, which is a series of very shallow lakes. So these lakes may be 200 acre lakes, but you can wade everywhere. And they have these huge trout and it's like bone fishing for trout. They're huge trout cruising, looking for insects. And I was fishing one of these lakes and it was tough. We weren't seeing a lot of fish. And you know that feeling, I'm sure every angler gets this, where you've gone long enough without seeing a fish or without a take that you really kind of stop believing it's gonna happen. You're like, all right, it's not happening today. This is fun, it's nice being out here, but I'm pretty sure I'm not gonna catch anything. And then I had cast my dry fly out and I saw this set of brown trout jaws come out of the water that didn't even really register because they were so big. Uh, in retrospect, my guess is that it was probably a 10 pound brown trout. But it was the slowest take I had ever seen in my life. And I simply couldn't wait. And I ended up ripping the fly right out of its mouth before its mouth closed on the fly. And that was it. That was my one shot for a week's fishing at one of those really big trout. Are there articles that just have to be completely scrapped? Whether I, it's never happened to me because, you know, for the for the previously stated reasons, you can have an incredible time without catching a giant fish. So if you read my story about Tasmania, it might be on it might be on mid current. I don't know. Maybe not. Might be too old for that. But it was a story about this incredible place. I saw huge fish. I know huge fish can be caught. We just didn't catch them. I, I never lie. I never say the fishing in Tasmania was incredible. We had a great time. And here's a stock photo of a huge trout. Uh, you know, the story was about how tough the fishing was. But it was also about how you could tell how incredible the fishing could be. We went to a taxidermist who took a, I think it was a 13 pound brown trout out of the freezer to show us that he was doing a skin mount on. Um, but yeah, I mean, the lakes were incredible. The problem is the entire island is a hydroelectric project. So the lakes that are at the top of the pl plateau feed the rivers that go out to the ocean, but they're all hydroelectric systems. And it just so happened that all the gates were wide open when we were there. All the rivers were literally in the trees. It happens. So that's what the article ended up being about. Were the kangaroos up in the trees, they got stranded? Uh, wallabies. Wallabies? Yeah. Um, but, you know, we saw incredible stuff. We saw the echidna, which is uh, a spiny tree. marsupial. Yep. We saw the tiger snake, which is one of the 10 deadliest snakes in the world. Wallabies everywhere, wombats. It's a very, very cool place. I would go back in a second, even if I couldn't uh, fish. Apparently there's some guy who claims to have seen the thylacine last week, the Tasmanian tiger. And wow, that would be amazing. Now, of course they say without evidence, they still believe they're gone. So a lot of Tasmanian devils, most of them on their backs, on the side of the road. Um, I don't know if we saw a live Tasmanian devil. But you know, you learn cool stuff. Like, did you know that the wombat's poop is a cube? I think I've read that, the colon shape. Yeah, it's amazing. It's like, how do you make a cube? 
Yeah, and that they when we were in Australia, they said if you hit a wombat, it will total your car. <laughs> and we didn't get out with the city far enough. Are there things you bring with you? Pad and paper, specific pen you like to write with? I'm going to uh, reveal something that may freak some people out, but I take almost no notes. And the reason is when I first started, when I worked at Outdoor Life, I found the notes ended up sort of uh, paralyzing me when I sat down to write. How am I going to take all of this stuff and get it all in? And uh, a writer friend suggested to me that I don't look at the notes and try to write the story and see how, how that turns out. And it, was, and it actually really, really helped. So my theory now is, if I spend a week fishing in, say, say when I went to Ireland, at the end of the day, I will jot down really good quotations and just a couple of very, very specific notes and leave it at that. And then when I sit down to write the story, I will pretty much read all of that stuff once and then put it away. I have a pretty good memory. And I really feel like the stuff that stays with you should be the stuff that's at the heart of the story. And so really the vast majority of what I write is from memory. And it's based on those points in the trip, those experiences in the trip that have really stuck with me more than anything else. But sometimes you get a sometimes you get a quotation that's just too good though, and you think, I have to nail this immediately so I don't forget it. Are there fishing things that go on every road trip, every flight with you? No, I'm not really a, I'm not really a creature of habit. I'm not a gearhead. So no, I I, I don't I'm not superstitious. I'm not a, a creature of habit. I really hate to travel. I love to be where I'm going, but I really hate the traveling part. So my traveling partner for many years now is a high school buddy of mine, Sandy Hayes, who is also a photographer. And we sort of made a deal years ago that if I took Sandy on all these trips with me, he would effectively shepherd me through the travel process and be my valet and do all of the worrying about making flights and stuff like that. And, uh, and I wouldn't have to do it. Cause I'm a nervous Nelly when I'm traveling. Uh -oh, we gotta make the flight, are we gonna get there on time? Oh gosh, there's a delay, are we gonna make our connection? Now I don't worry about that at all, that's Sandy's job. I like that. Yeah. The only thing that's incredibly annoying about traveling with Sandy is that he's often asleep before the plane pulls away from the gate. And I find it incapable to sleep on an airplane. It's always hot. They don't have the air conditioning going in that, that first bit. I'll wake up just when the plane takes off. It's just gross in there. I can't even go to sleep. So, you know, like I said, that trip to Tasmania was 36 hours total travel time. I didn't sleep a wink. Um, so you're starting your, your week-long fishing adventure in a daze. Are there any... Orvis products that you, you endorse to take with you? Oh, you cannot beat the uh, carry it all travel case. It's the one that Dan packs everything in? Oh, yeah. You take your rods out of the tubes and you can fit, God, I don't know, probably six four piece fly rods in there, all your reels, most of your fly. But yeah, that, that's the one piece of, of travel gear. Um, you know, everybody has a roller duffel. Um, but that carry it all is, is a lifesaver. And just the whole idea, before I worked for Orvis uh, and started hanging around with the travel guys, it would have never occurred to me to travel with my rod not in a tube. But then you realize what a huge pain in the ass rod tubes are. <laughs> you know, these rods, of course, are all have lifetime guarantees as well, so you don't worry too much 
by breaking them. Yes. And I never broke a rod in my entire life until I, until I started traveling. Broke three rods on my first trip to uh, Argentina. Um, I was amazed. Accidents, falling. Uh, first one was I uh, set the hook on a sunken log. Second one was, I don't know if you remember, but uh, a company, not Orvis, at one time was advertising a nano titanium fly rod. And it was supposed to be super fast action and whatever, but it had a bit of a blowing up problem uh, because of the brittleness of the fibers. You can't and so, make a fly rod out of that then. <laughs> so I was casting, you know, to be fair, it was a four weight. And I think I was casting a double bugger rig and it, it literally just blew up in my hand. That's the only time that's ever happened to me. Blew up at the, at the handle. Just had a call. His and brand then, new rod just, it snapped to the cork. Yeah. And I just said, uh, I haven't seen that before. <laughs> we were just casting and just the cork handle just bent 90 degrees. Yeah, I've never had that happen. I broke, I always break rods in the cork. I do a lot of um, scrambling over rocks in mountain streams. And uh, twice now I've fallen and put my hand down, my rod hand down to brace myself and and broken the uh the blank underneath the cork that's frustrating yeah that's no good although the one bonus there is you can still finish out the day you just hold the rod higher up on the blank how has um uh, you know publishing's changed over the years ha has anything else changed since you know that you're 10 years at orvis just the way that, you know, between online and social media and how you Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, the magazine business is, you know, we had three national fly fishing magazines. Now we have one, both uh, American Angler and Fly Rod and Reel have bitten the dust. And I also think there used to be way more fly fishing blogs back in the day when I started this. You know, there was Tom Chandler. There was Ass Hooked Whitey. There were there were a whole bunch of fly fishing blogs in the early 2010s. But it's just hard. It's hard to maintain a fly fishing blog if you're updating constantly. So I'm trying to think of how many, you know, there's Gink and Gasoline, there's us. Midcurrent isn't technically a blog. It's It's more of a a huge site, but Marshall Cutchin does an incredible amount of work to keep that going. So yeah, so I think there was this initial flurry of fly fishing blogs, but the vast majority of them have either gone away or have become much less active. Uh, and you know, there's also Facebook sort of did away with the online message boards that were super popular back in the day. I think Washington fly fishing is still pretty popular. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think. Are you on any message boards? I'll visit the North American one. Just read up on things, but not, not like I used to be. Yeah. I used to be on all sorts of message boards. And I was also, when I worked at an office, and there would be hours and hours of just staring at a computer, waiting for something to come around. <laughs> When you're a fishing trout bum and you're in an office all day, you, you read fishing blogs. Right. Well, I mean, I assume that's what people do with Orvis News. But, you know, Facebook and Instagram have been ginormous game changers. And it's funny because I'm a, I'm a bit of a dinosaur in that I'm a word guy. So Instagram doesn't really have uh, the same fascination for me, but I watch my colleagues uh, who are totally into it and and they can just devour an incredible amount of content in a very short period of time. So, you know, I don't know, as, as, as the attention span of the average fly fishing reader gone down, I don't know. You know, we will occasionally publish something that's really long but really good and people will read all of it. You really get the feeling that 
there is always a next thing. Is is fly fishing TikTok going to become a huge thing? I don't know. We now that Instagram talk- has reels. Yeah, we, we've not done the TikTok yet in this house. I'm trying to avoid that. <laughs> do you have a daughter? I do. How old? Nine. She likes to look at my wife's Instagram, which I think is just restaurants. Okay, I say um, give, give it three years. Yeah. I, I have a 16-year-old daughter. So I'm there, there's TikTok and all the time going on in this house. Yeah. All right. I'm going to move on to some other questions now. Do we cover everything? in your life that worth sharing for the others to hear as far as i can tell we got me from from rural new hampshire to rural vermont yeah all right uh how are the spurs doing this season oh tottenham hotspur is having a rough go of it you know back in november they beat man city and people started to believe the wheels came off Things seem to have gotten better, but um, yes, Tottenham Hotspur has not been great since they were in the Champions League final two years ago. You got Gareth Bale back now? Yes, and he suddenly seems healthy, which is exciting. Uh, He looked great in the last game, but it wasn't against great competition. We'll see the North London Derby's in two weeks, I think, and that's uh, that'll be a real test. Very nice. Probably watch it unless the shatter in and I'm I'm not working again. Yeah. Okay, who's got the best sandwich up in your part of Vermont? Well, that's got to be the Wayside Country Store, which is a mere three minutes from my home oh, on the banks of the Battenkill. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so when you go to the Wayside Country Store, you get the Vermont special, which is smoked turkey, Granny Smith apple, and Vermont cheddar cheese, and maple butter wow. on a roll. Yeah, it's for reals. Do they have? And a- you can sit when this is all over. You can sit at the what's called the round table in the Wayside Country Store. And a little known fact is that round ta- table came out of the house of Lee and Joan Wolf when they moved from Sandgate, Vermont to the Catskills. Wow. Yes. Yes, I my little town of. 400 people was once home to Lee and Joan Wolf. That's pretty cool. Uh, when, when you were in Northern Jersey, did you ever have the original Jersey Sloppy Joe? I don't think I did. Okay. But, you know, the, speaking of Jersey, I think people don't give Jersey enough credit for how good the fishing is, especially in the northwestern part of the state. I spent... Well, of course, Tim Flagler has probably done a lot for uh, Jersey's fly fishing reputation. There are really some beautiful trout-filled streams in New Jersey, not to mention the entire coast. Yeah, Steve Sautner's out there all the time catching all sorts of little wild brown trout. Yeah, for a long time, my largest brook trout was caught in the Ken Lockwood Gorge area of the uh, south branch of the Raritan River. Would that go out to the ocean then? Would that be a uh, sulfur? No, I don't think so. Okay. I think it was probably stocked. All right. And they got lots of dams there anyway. But it was, I mean, it was a legit 16-inch brook trout on oh. a stonefly nymph. Uh, do you have a favorite Samuel L. Jackson movie? Well, I think it's got to be Pulp Fiction. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite Girl Scout cookie? Thin Mint. All right. What's your drink these days, especially on your 367th day of March? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would have to say a Hendrix Martini up, very dry, with two olives stuffed with jalapeno peppers and two actual jalapeno peppers my dad's just, friend used to drink vodka or gin martinis with jalapeno stuffed it's the best olives. and i think the hotel chain was going to just call them the oswalds like it, it, mm-hmm. whatever hotel chain like the ritzer he was at the bar so often 
<laughs> we're just going to need to drink after him. Uh, yeah. So no. Yeah. My both my wife and I are are serious martini people. I do like the Hendrix. Yeah. Also, recently uh, been trying other gins to see what else really floats my boat. There are a lot of gins out there that are good. A lot of people drinking that purple gin. Yeah, I, it, I like my gin to be medicinal in flavor. Right. I don't want it to. Of, I, don't, I don't want it to. I don't want it to be too florid. Right. Uh, we were. Uh, I think our gin right now is Dogfish Head from Delaware. I think that's what hmm. we have right now. I can't keep track of you know. It's just get the wife a bottle of gin. <laughs> her, you know, her birthday is on Saturday. I usually get her gin, but I got her the the giant stuffed uh, baguette from Amazon. It's a forty plus inch realistic looking baguette pillow. Nice. She loves bread. But yeah, like, home, like Homer Simpson's giant sub. Yeah. Man, <laughs> Jersey and sandwiches. Now I'm getting hungry. If you only had one type of soup to eat the rest of your life, what would it be? My own homemade chicken soup. Nice. You ever put matzo balls in there? I don't, but I do love me a good matzo ball. You know, these are things where when you're in Jersey, they're easy to get, but right. in uh, rural Vermont, not so much. Yeah, same with Northern Virginia. Uh, if you could have any pet, exotic, domestic, regardless of laws, regulations, and rules of Vermont, what would you have? I don't see how I could possibly beat my dog, Petey, who is the greatest dog who has ever lived. Anyone who's friends with me on social media has seen Petey a lot. He's a, like a beagle-ish mix? No, we, we think he's a rescue. Uh, we think he's a mix of a poodle and a cairn terrier. Okay. So he's both smart and feisty. Good. The dogs are hard to come by. All right, and then uh, the final question, until I see you next time, is uh, get a fish story. The one that got away, other than the brown trout in Tasmania. Any other fish that may have haunted you throughout the years? Well, that fish is certainly the one that has haunted me the most uh, through the years. Cogitate on, that. that's the one, mostly because how badly I needed that fish. You know, I've, I've really gotten to the point in my fishing career where I literally don't need a fish. Um, I like to catch fish. I like to catch big fish. Uh, um, if I could catch a lot of big fish, that would be great. But, you know, I live on the bat and kill. I would say 70% of the time I fish the bat and kill, I catch nothing. And I love it. One fish that is, a, it's not a lost fish, it's a caught fish. But when I was a guide at Chalatna Lake Lodge, I had a family from Russia, uh, a mother, a father, and a daughter who was ill. I don't remember what the illness was, but they were on their way to New York City to see some sort of medical specialist for the daughter. But they wanted to stop and go fishing. And so... Uh, we went to Eight Mile Slough uh, in Squintna, Alaska. Squintna is uh, stop number one on the Iditarod. And uh, Eight Mile Slough flows into the Squintna River right there. And it, when the salmon are in, it's a great place to fish. And so this girl, she, she was sort of frail and the parents were, were obviously concerned. And you know, you got sort of got the feeling that Maybe they were having this experience in case she never got to do it again. And so she was just fishing eggs under a bobber and a fish bit. And over the next half hour, the daughter tried to fight the fish. Then one parent would hold the rod while the daughter cranked. The other one did. I would hold the rod. It was like this group effort. This girl was maybe nine or 10. And she ended up landing a 46 pound king salmon. Wow. And by the end, you know, and they barely spoke English. They were all crying hysterically and laughing and whatever. And we pulled this thing on board and it was just one of the most joyful fishing experiences ever. 
It was like things could not possibly have gone better in that moment for that kid, for the family. Um, and I never saw them again and never heard about what happened uh, with the child. But that particular moment has always stood out as this really special on the water experience for me. That's brilliant. Still the biggest king salmon I've ever landed. It's bigger than my nine-year-old. <laughs> All right. Where can listeners find you on the blog or on social media? Or if uh, you ever end up back, did you have an office at headquarters or did you work out of your house? No, no, I have an office. I, I sit right next to Tom Rosenbauer. All right. Yeah. Uh, which is, you know, a, a miraculous thing in and of itself. Um, you can, you know, I don't know. Come down and do some shad fishing in about a month and a half. You've met Tom, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, let me take a minute to just talk about what an incredible guy Tom Rosenbar is. He's probably at this point top three most famous American fly fishermen, maybe of all time. But he doesn't have an ounce of ego and if you're ever at a fishing show with him or whatever he will he's like that rock star who signs the very last autograph of the kids waiting out behind the stage door tom has an endless capacity to stand there and talk to people about fly fishing and i'm sure he ends up having the same conversation 50 times a day at somerset but he will just stand there and really engage with people in ways that I don't, I don't know if I could do it that much, frankly. And he's just, we have an absolute blast hanging out in the office. I really think Tom should be a national hero. Yeah. How far are you from the bar that Dan created? 15 feet. Wow. And of course, Dan lives right down the hill from me. I can actually kind of see his house right now. See, I live in Melody's aunt's old house. No way. Yes. And then on New Year's Day, my neighbor Bonnie brings black eyed peas that are Melody's aunt's recipe. That's funny. We had our first, of course, this is Dan's first real winter in the new house. And in early January, we got a huge dump of snow, like 26 inches. So I sent him an email. I said, uh, you're from Virginia, so you probably don't know what a roof rake is. Why don't you come up and borrow mine? <laughs> and so he came up and I showed him how to use the roof rake, roof rake to get the snow off his roof. He was stunned. He was like, I've never even heard of such a thing. Yeah, I don't need those here. We've had, we were supposed to have had three or four, eight to seven to eight inch snowstorms, and we haven't gotten anything over two inches this year. We've had snow on the ground now for... I mean, total snow cover for, I don't know, eight weeks. Wow. Now my first tomato seed's going to sprout today for the garden. <laughs> now I've already got the, the spring garden going. Tomatoes and peppers are all, and moonflowers are all germinating. And then the shad, sh the herring should be in. It's going to be 60 next week. So I'm assuming that the shad are going to be in in a couple of weeks early if it continues this way. But Mother Nature always throws us. How's the snakehead fishery? It's crazy. We got one last year, last cast of the day on a damselfly. Wow. And then, yeah, six and a half pound snakehead on a size 10 damsel. And then I got four in one day and then like two on another. Uh, they're crazy, man. It's, it's, <laughs> we did that one we caught on the damselfly. We hit it with a rock eight times. <laughs> uh, put a knife through its head three times and it was still flopping around it's just the problem the weirdest animal and then they jump and migrate like salmon so you can just be chilling in a canoe or kayak and they'll just bounce off your boat <laughs> jump three four feet in the air it's insane that's hilarious yeah i mean you guys gotta come do a road trip yeah someday that'll be a thing again yeah Come down and check out Art's store. And too bad we don't have our beer ties anymore because then we could have you guys, you know, around one of our events for the title yeah. Fly Rotters. I'm a shitty fly tire, though. I, I spend too much time playing the guitar to tie flies. 
No, it's pretty cool. I'm shitty at that too. Yeah, I, I tried learning last year during lockdown and my wife said it was too loud. So the guitar is <laughs> sitting there. But I'm going to start tying. I don't know. I probably got, I got two shad fly orders today. So yeah, it's my busy season to tie damsels and jigs and shad flies galore. Sweet. All right. You think you got what you need? I got everything. Thank you so much. And just the uh, Orvis blog and P. Monahan on email. Monahan P. Monahan P. Yeah, the blog is news.orvis.com. Everyone should have that bookmarked if they don't already. And of course, Facebook, Instagram. I don't run the Instagram account. My uh, my colleague Drew Nisbet runs that and does a killer job. Um, but yeah. Wasn't he out in Buffalo? He was. He was the store manager in Buffalo. Yeah. He's awesome. Fantastic. All right, Phil. Thank you so much for your time. And yeah, it was fun. I, you know, it's funny. I sit next to Tom, of course, and he's under constant demand. No one ever asked to talk to me. So I'm, thank yeah, you. I'm generally, I'm the man behind the curtain. Yes. <laughs> and you've got a great radio voice. All right. Thanks, man. Good to talk All to right, you. Cheers. Thanks so much. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com. This podcast is brought to you by Freestone Productions at freestoneproductions.com.